So, the Elder Collaborative came together in February of 2018. We have representation from the Seniors Committee, Seniors Housing, Robson Valley Community Services, uh, the physicians at the Health Centre. Uh, our lead physician with this collaborative is Dr. Cater. Unfortunately, he had a conflict, conflicting conference in Prince George today. He, he would like to have been here, but he sends his regrets. Um, we have local seniors at the table, and within Northern Health, we have our social worker, primary care assistant, our interprofessional team lead, um, our primary care nurses, uh, the physician coach and the clinic manager, as well as the HSA and our community health workers as well. Um, community paramedics sit at our table, vi uh, village counselor, the BC um, emergency health services unit chief, and our local um, fitness instructors. So the aim of the collaborative is to promote positive, um, pro proactive care to prolong the ability to stay in our homes. So anything that we can do to keep people in their homes, in our community longer, is what we're all about. So we look at the gaps and, um, and we look at what we're doing well. So some of our accomplishments are this little um, pocketbook, which you all have in your, gift, in your um, swag bag. Uh, we put this together with all the local resources on it. Um, so we did that. That was one of the first things we did. We also looked at our fall data uh, with the plan to conduct fall risk assessments in the home by our community paramedic and primary care nurses. Uh, and the purpose of that is to ensure safety in the home um, and maybe support and navigate families and community members to maybe uh, reach out for funding to get equipment if needed in the home, to stay in the home. Um, and then we did the Blue Bottle Campaign. Um, by our local uh, community paramedic, and that was a campaign we did in September of 2018. Um, Derek's going to speak to that campaign a little bit later in the day. So the funding came from um, CBT, so we applied for an event planning grant, which we were lucky to receive, and also from the UBCM um, age-friendly grant, uh, which is UBC municipalities. Thank you, Holly, for the eyes. Um, and then we'd just like to thank Jeannie for catering the lunch today. And yeah, so did you have any questions about the collaborative or anything at this point? There's quite a few of us in the room to answer any if you do. If you think of any later, you can, you're more than welcome to ask us. And so we're going to start the morning with our panel. We have Terry Stewart in the room, Louise McLean, and Joan Nordley's story of aging in Belmont. So if you'd just like to come up to the front. So this is Terry Stewart, and this is her story of aging in Belmont. So thank you for coming today. Aging in Belmont, I am so, um, no, in fact, the, the, even this is scary. Do I have to talk loud? Like this? Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, first of all, I have to apologize for my husband because um, he was supposed to be here as well. But um, with the lovely weather we've been having, he is still making hay in October, <laughs> like four months late. So anyhow, I'm the Stewart family representative. Um, aging in place in Belmont. This morning I was lying in bed and um, I was thinking, there's no place in the world I would rather live. You know, you look out and you see these fabulous mountains and the people, we have just the best people in the world. Um, our healthcare system, you know, I had an accident in May and um, I could not ask for better treatment. Um, we have good neighbors. I think we have more food than you could imagine 
Um, no, it was just really, and uh, our children are all in the city, like in Edmonton or in Kelowna, and uh, they say, you know, well, when you're ready to retire, why don't you move to the city? I think Jim and I would go crazy in the city. I really do. You know, it's, um, yeah, it, and we couldn't afford it, for one thing. So, um, yeah, I, I'm just very happy to be here, and, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> How long have you lived here? We've lived here um, 43 years, and we moved from Vancouver. And if you don't think that was a shock, you know, we had three teenagers, and I remember we were driving along, and we saw this really old shack, and Jim said, well, that's where we're going to be living. And they were like, <laughs> really? You know? I mean, we had moved from Surrey in a, like a five-bedroom house, and then we ended up living in the center, which was a whole other experience. And, um, but, you know, they, they all adjusted. I mean, I think it was more difficult for some of them than others. And, um, but, you know, they, some of them still don't like coming back, but most of them, you know, really enjoy coming back. And, I mean, Mary came back. She worked here for a while, and I mean, when Gary died, the support was just unbelievable. You know, if he'd been in the city, he would've just been another statistic. And sort of like, oh, well, too bad. So, no, it's just really, really an incredible place. And, um, you know, when I had my accident, we had the um, gal from Home Support come out, because Chris, our oldest boy, he's, he's, he's a big help. And uh, he said, I think you should try to get home support. So she came out, she talked to us, and uh, we realized that, honestly, we didn't need it. Because, you know, between, we, I have someone who comes and clean house one, every two weeks, and we have great neighbors and good family, so, you know, what more do you want? Anyhow, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Terry. Um, Johnny? Um, Mom has asked me to speak for her today. I, I guess I better get my glasses on here. <laughs> um, Louise McLean, aging in Dale Mount. In 1960, Sandy and I and our two children, Donnie and Ian, were living in Edson when Sandy had an opportunity to work in Dale Mount at Canyon Creek Sawmill. My sister Gwen and her husband Harry were already living in Bale Mount, so it was an easy decision. We settled into life in the mountains with a local population of about 200. In those days, no doctor, no dentist in the village, and when our third child, Rob, came along, I traveled to Edson and stayed with Sandy's parents until I went into Edson Hospital for the birth. When we needed a dentist, we had to travel to Hinton or Edson. The roads connecting us to the outside world were unpaved dirt roads full of hazards like washouts, rutted mud holes and rocks that slid down from above and landed in the middle of the road. Trips to Jasper and Hinton were pilgrimages and you prepared with food and supplies in case you got stuck behind a slide, a bridge out or broke down with a hole in your gas tank from the rocks. Oh, sorry Laurel. I have difficulty with my hearing. Okay. Um, I'm hearing you, but it's a bit too fast. Oh, okay. I, I, I guess it's nervousness. I will slow down. <laughs> Thanks, Laurel. Okay. Uh, we lived in a shack on what is now 6th Avenue as we built our own home, the home I still occupy today. I continued my teaching career at the local school until the mid-80s when I retired. Is that better, Laurel? That's better. Okay. I was proud to see my husband Sandy elected as the first mayor of Vailmo when we incorporated the village. Incorporation as a municipality allowed us to gain access to federal and provincial funding for much needed infrastructure such as water, roads and sewer and all the other benefits being incorporated gave us. I have loved living here and after 57 years can't imagine living anywhere else. During my years here I've seen many changes some good and some not so good, but we're grateful to have things like the clinic, the ambulance, the fire department, and the organizations such as the Elder Care Collaborative, 
who are working toward improving life for the growing number of seniors in Vailmont. Vailmont was always a wonderful place to live and raise a family. Our recreation was fishing, exploring the canoe reach, now Kinbasket Lake by boat, berry picking, gardening, playing the piano, handicrafts too numerous to mention, knitting, hiking. Our community and social life was always busy. Over the years, we belonged to and served many different organizations, such as the Community Club, the Marina Association, United Church, Lions Club, the Ladies Walking Club, the Leather Club, the Pottery Club, the Senior Social Club, and many others. I am proud to have been part of the group that worked so hard to initiate and build the Golden Years Lodge in the early 80s, and I served on the board for a number of years. At that time, we thought this was just the first step, and that the next step, assisted living, was soon to follow. I am now 92 years old. There's no housing for a person with my abilities, assisted living, in Bailmont. I'm worried about what my next step will be. Where will I have to go if I become more disabled? Assisted living and extended care facilities are what I feel are most needed in Bailmont now. Our population is aging, and those of us who have been here and built the village feel like we are at great risk for suitable housing and care, as there is no place here and nowhere to go. I live in my own home, but without the daily help and ongoing support of my family, my neighbours and my dedicated friends, I would not be able to cope. Meals and Wheels has been a great help. The food is just as good as when I volunteered as a delivery driver, and I'm always amazed at how willing people are to lend a hand when they notice something is needed. The programs in place to help seniors stay in their houses are well-intentioned, but seem hard-pressed to provide services beyond friendly visiting. Volunteers are doing a wonderful job, but some things can't be left to volunteers, who are risking burnout and aging themselves. Services I would love to see provided are transportation to appointments, like hairdresser and foot care appointments, a home handyman program with dependability for lawn mowing, yard cleanup, fence mending, eaves trough clearing, etc. And a more rigorous outreach program from the Golden Years Lodge to those of us being taken care of at home. A program that informs us of activities taking place and connects able-bodied volunteers with people who have mobility limitations would help me a lot. I sometimes hear of events taking place in the Golden Years Lodge like yoga or cards or other seniors gatherings and outings and I'd love to go but I've lost most of my sight and my hearing and use a walker, so I can't just be dropped off, but need an able-bodied companion to transport me there and participate. Thank you for listening. I appreciate everything that is being done by me, by so many. Vailmont really is a wonderful place to live. Thank you, Louise, for sharing your story. Thank you for um, sharing it, reading it to us, Donnie. So now we have Betty Hannes to share her story of aging in Bellman. I think Louise has said it all. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. <laughs> well, um, I, I'm from Bellman. I was born in Jasper, and at the time, that's where our medical system really was, how we traveled by train. Um, Going to make ride was a very dusty, long journey. And um, I remember when I was small, I had been playing outdoors, and I came in to change, jumped from a bed to a dresser. I don't know why you're changing on a dresser, but there was a needle in the wall, and the needle went into my wrist. So my uncle had to um, flag a freight train down and my dad and I went to Jasper. Um, and it was quite an experience for me at the time because I had, it was a Catholic hospital at the time and I had never seen a nun before. And my dad had left me overnight there. <laughs> so I put up quite a fuss in the morning. <laughs> and I remember taking an x-ray going into a dark room with a trough in it. But um, yeah, my, my mom came here and she was six months old. Um, 1919 is when she was born. My grandparents came here from 
um, Minnesota and South Dakota. And that's where we got our start here in, in Belmont. I think Louise has mentioned the roads being very dusty. When we went to um, Jasper or McBride, we usually, for dentistry, we usually went in the summertime or during a holiday, and then we would go out of town, Jasper, or eventually it was Hinton, and then Kamloops. Um, I've seen the progress of um, the medical services in Belmont change over the years. Originally, it was a little clinic over across from the United Church. And then from there, we had visiting doctor from Jasper at the time. Then we had doctors come from um, Jasper, and I think the clinic, they didn't have a clinic, but it was over at the Surat Motel upstairs. And um, from there, then I guess the Belmont Clinic was built. And I think I'm very happy with the clinic here now. We have very good doctors. We seem to get out of town in a hurry if you need an appointment. I have friends that have a hard time getting appointments when they live in the city. And I find that um, we're very lucky in that respect. Um, I'm, I'm not prepared, obviously. <laughs> so <laughs> I can't think of them. Um, of anything else. Brian was supposed to be here this morning on this panel, but he's, he doesn't like speaking in public. But he came here, and I like to think that's the reason because I met him in high school and I came here. <laughs> he says he came here to work on highways as a surveyor. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I think that's all I've got to say. Um, we're still very happy living in Belmont. Down the road, I don't know where, what we'll do. Depends on our medical needs, I would think. Um, during, I would really like to see a long-term care in Belmont. My mom was in Jasper for six and a half years and um, my sisters and I drove every week to Jasper and it was very tiring after a while, especially in the winter time. And seeing the number of people from Belmont that are in the McBride Hospital, I think that um, long-term care is needed here in Belmont. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Can I just add a little note about the, um, about the medical system? Last Christmas, um, our, old, our youngest granddaughter was here and she had bronchitis. And uh, she's a bit of a drama queen. And um, so she was really um, quite apprehensive. So they went to the clinic. Within half an hour, she had seen a doctor. She had got a prescription and she was home. Now, if they, they live in Edmonton, she would have been in the Medi Center for five hours. So, you know, that's another reason to live here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Okay, so I'm proud to be um, reading Joan Nordley's story of her aging in Belmont. I'm her daughter-in-law. Um, and Joan, um, being Joan, hasn't written a story, but... Um, a bit of a book. So kick back, you might want to get up and get a cup of coffee. Um, I just feel out of respect for Joan, I'd like to read it in its entirety. Um, and it's handwritten. So I'll do my best not to um, flub it up. Some of the writing is a bit, um, well it's of her 84 year old hand, so it's a bit shaky in places. So, aging in Valmont. Entering Valmont June 5th, 1965, I noticed the entire valley and was surrounded by mountains. As I was born and raised in the Crow's Nest Pass in the southern Canadian Rocky Mountains, I immediately felt at home. Arnie, Dennis, Julianne, James, and I in our family car crossed the tracks which were opposite to the Valmont Hotel and stopped at the Swift Creek Motel to book a room. Then we toured the village, stopped at the town hall office to ask for maps of the area. Tom Wood, the town clerk, gave us maps and I questioned him as to the need of teachers in this area. Tom's response was, how many can you bring? <laughs> we retraced our way along the old highway to Dawson Construction Camp, south of the Fraser Bridge. 
Arnie questioned a few of the guys hanging out by their trailers as to where the bosses were. In the camp of married men across the bridge and to the right of the highway. Thus, Arnie was hired to help build Highway 5 and what was to be the Yellowhead Highway to the Alberta border. We then traveled through Rogers Pass to our home, a 10 by 40 mobile home which was purchased in Edmonton, Alberta after the loss of our house in a fire in March 12th of 1965 in our home of Chair Hill, Alberta. I had a class of 37 to 45 students in schools in Whiteport, 37 grade threes, Rockport Bridge, 42, four, five, and six grades, and grade six, one room. Chair Hill, 39, four, five, and six grades in one room. And lastly, 45 grade nines in my room and 45 grade nines in Roy Thompson's room across the hall from me. I covered social studies in English, grammar, and literature for the 90 students. Roy taught the mathematics and the science courses. The extra courses were taught in our class only. And at the end of the school, 90 students faced provincial exams. During the summer, I marked grade nine provincial exams for six weeks, which I had done for six years. Thus, I had spent the entire years teaching in Lakshank An, school district number 57. Mid-August, Arnie came to pick up the family and to motor to Valmont for our new home. He had taken the mobile home to Valmont on his trip, dropping the family in Edmonton for my job. Upon arriving in Valmont, we spread the mobile home parked at the hotel. We spot, oh sorry. Upon arriving in Belmont, we spied the mobile home parked at the hotel. Having connected with Tom Wood, his wife Arlene, had two trailer lots across from the school on the corner of Fifth Avenue and Dogwood Street, across from Ballard's Garage. This is going way back. Some of these names I, I'm not familiar with, but I'm sure some of you are. Harold Schmidt and his mother Clara were putting up their mobile home next to us. Um, same moment in time, great neighbors indeed. Thus we began our journey of life in Valmont, BC. I began teaching in the old 1937 school next to the library. Outdoor bathrooms, wood stove, windows on the north side only, packed water from deforges for the station house, Floors were so cold, we sat on our feet. I thought I'd gone back to teaching in a one-room school 40 years ago, only it was September 1965. Like my first grade, I had 37 grade three. How wonderful. One blessed fact about the people in Valmont was they cared about newcomers and welcomed them with open arms. Friendliness abound, I had no trouble finding a babysitter for my three children, Dennis eight, Julianne four, and James two. Chloe Beeson was the first, and she lasted for one year as we moved to commercial and corner of Third Avenue across from our residence, residence of which one was Yvonne and Claude Berubi. Yeah, okay. Yvonne minded James and Julianne for two years. In 1968, we bought a new mobile home, lot, lot 23, and the sawdust piles beside Swift Creek from Emerald Valley Enterprises Limited, um, George Hicks. Lot 23 was the lot next to Keith, big, big, thank you, Bigelow, um, blue roofed cabin. As a 12-year-old girl, I was much taller than an average 12-year-old. Although only 12, I became a nanny to three preschoolers with parents Lynn and Bob. My grandpa Cartwright was also a pit boss who carried, carried a canary in its cage down to the mine shafts to, to locate pockets of methane gas. With the Payne family, I would travel with the children and mind them so their parents had some time on their own. This interaction with the children instilled an amazing love and care for children. Teaching was what I wanted to do with my life. 
During the years 66 to 69, when a substitute was needed to teach grades 8, 9, and 10, I would get a sub for my class and teach the higher grades as I had experience of six years with grade 9 students in Alberta. However, what a surprise behold me, July 19, 1969, a baby boy was born on the day that man walked on the moon. I watched the walk on TV in McBride Hospital. Um, the seniors watching the walk were asking, how could that happen? How could Hollywood make such pictures? Uh, today there are still doubters of the walk on the moon. Summer of 67, I attended classes at UBC to upgrade my teaching certificate. Mom Nordley had purchased a 10 by 35 mobile home in 66 and attached it to ours um, as a breezeway. She picked blueberries for hours up the canoe and in the gravel pits of CNR. To her, Velma was a little Norway, and she loved it. Unfortunately, she passed away July 7, 67, while I was attending UBC. However, I flew to Edmonton, met the Nordley family at the airport, staying with Marie, the second oldest child of the Nordley family. I attended the funeral service and promptly returned to UBC Vancouver to complete my schooling. With all, the road, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. With all the road construction, forestry, and new businesses in Belmont, school population spiked. Teaching in the United Church Hall for 70 to 73 and moving in 74 to the high school where grades 1 to 10 gathered as the new Belmont Elementary School was being built. Alita Bain was minding Jeff until he entered school September of 78. Marge... Wilson had him in kindergarten, 77 to 78, in my first old school on Main Street. In 79, I purchased a 14 by 70 mobile, which was set up on a cement pad 100 meters from Swift Creek. Life was busy, building gardens, attending church meetings as treasurer, secretary, president, and teaching. In 1971, Arnie bought a case backhoe, and his first job was putting water lines under Swift Creek Motel. Then he had gained a contract with the village to install water and sewage lines throughout the Emerald Valley Enterprises Limited lands that had been surveyed by, by the Rio Dwyer. In 1980, we began the Vale Mountain Area Museum Society, which actually has a picture. A picture of the crew, which you can't see, but I'll leave it on one of the tables so you can have a look. So in 1980, we began the Vale Mountain Area Museum Society, Vale Mountain Historical Society. Frank Blackman was the president, Louise McLean was the secretary, Alita Bain, coordinator, Joan Nordley, treasurer, Elise Blackman, Gina Sadchek, Isabel Cochran, and Leonard Fraser. It was Leonard who directed us to compose a book about the people who built Vale Mountain and area, not and not move, move the station for the museum. The production of the Yellowhead Pass and its people was another story which I prepared for Paul Johnson recently. Then moving of the station led to the year 2000, the memorable homecoming week in Valmont. During the years 65 to 2000, I had an album containing events leading up to the 2000 celebration. Other members of the village had made albums for the homecoming weekend too. Visiting families and friends so enjoyed them. In addition, we sold the last copies of the Yellowhead Pass and its people. What with teaching, I was, so I was elected counselor for the village of Valmont. During this period, Dennis, Julianne, and James left from the home to design their own careers. Jeff continued his schooling in Kimberley, playing hockey, and finished playing hockey and graduated from Quinnell High School. The busiest time of my life, 1980 to 2000, 20 years, I continued teaching until 2005 when I had a heart attack. However, I actually retired in June of 93, but returned teaching um, special needs, special learning needs, half time until 2005. Throughout the years, family and friends would phone or write, what is there in Valmont that you can that you can do to spend your time relaxing, enjoying family and friends. My response was, 
find the time to do all the things that are available in Bailmount. My motto in life was, friends and family are necessary for supporting their elders as they age. Friends and family and hugs are, are the main ingredients for a darn good life. As counselor, along with Bobby Rowe, we bought the medical bus, we, sorry, brought the medical bus to the Robson Valley. In addition, I applied to Spark to have special parking privileges for handicapped people in Valmont. Doris McCurdy thanked me many times as she brought Nicola to town to shop, visit family and friends, to go to church, to school, and to doctor um, appointments. In conclusion, I aged well in Valmont. Many friends and family, Kim, Dee, and Den, pitched in and helped me stay healthy. For 53 years, I've, I hope I've left Arnie, James, Julianne, Dennis, Jeff, imprints, sorry. On the life in this little mountain valley. Sorry, I just have to regroup. Reading James's name over and over is kind of... <laughs> Fate stepped in and I had an accident that required an extra pair of hands to heal the injury. Moved to where Doug and Julianne Cadets have, oh, gosh, oh, where Doug and Julianne have um, an orchard farm. The only thing missing from this farm is a horse. <laughs> Doug said never. Horsepower instead. James, December 20, 2011. Arnie, August 17, 2012, are buried. And one day. Whew, sorry. And one day I'll be buried with Arnie. Meanwhile, life goes on in Carameas, but I'm connected to family and friends by mail and phone. I'm sorry this story's so long, um, too long, but 53 years is a long time. Um, I have other stories for the museum, Emerald Valley Enterprises Limited, Paul Johnson, the book, the bookmarker, spans 74 years. Hopefully these stories end up in the GOAT newspaper. In addition, a great thank you will be sent to the GOAT for the wonderful album coordinated by Ellen Duncan from the people of Alma. Splendid, and I truly appreciate it. Um, Joan Nordley. That was harder than I thought. Um, so I thank you all for being part of the panel this morning. I know how, I personally know how difficult it is to sit here in front of a group of people and share your stories, but we all appreciate it very much. So thank you very much. Let's give them a big round of applause. And just before they go, if there's any questions, any additional questions to anyone on the panel? <coughs> No, nope, we're good to go. Okay. Oh, sorry. When we're going to have care for people living here, it's pretty clear that need is huge. I, I think Joan really added to it, like everybody else, that you've lived all your life in Belmont, but when you need somebody to care for you, you have to leave. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Family and friends do it as far as they can, but we could have we could have the care that's given in McBride we could have here. Absolutely, and I think that conversation is bigger than all of us in the room, but it's a conversation that we do need to have. And I think it's happening at the municipal levels and our housing um, committee levels and things like that. So um, I appreciate that, Laurel, and definitely it is um, an issue for Belmont. Uh, I, I just have a comment. I, I really appreciated Louise's uh, um, a list of the things, the very, the very little things that, that are sometimes hard to imagine when, when you can just do things. You, it's hard to imagine. And she listed the kind of things that she would like to do or that she needs help doing. And um, that very specific list was actually very helpful. Thank you, Louise. And there is a community group to help with lots of those items on the list. So if, uh, 
if at some time during the day if you want to speak to the Robson Valley Community Services and the Better at Homes program. Um, they have a lot of support and um, information at their booth. Okay, I'd like to welcome Derek McClure, our um, Ambulance Unit Chief, to come and talk to us about a few things that are going on in our community. Thank you, Derek. Um, for the gentleman that couldn't come before me, uh, early flu season this year, so if you, if you do get flu shots, remember to get them early. A um, couple things I'd like to talk about, especially uh, for winter preparation. Uh, let's make sure we have our cleats. Um, uh, we all wear helmets ourselves when we're out on the highway in the slippery conditions. Uh, nobody wants a hip fracture or a broken arm in the middle of winter, so um, at the minimum, uh, in the mornings, Village does a great job of snow clearing and whatnot, but they don't do your personal steps and driveways. Try to think if it's really that important that morning that you need to go out. Can it wait? Can you get somebody else to go out when, it, when we have our winter storms? Um, I'm up here on a sales pitch to not come to your home. So uh, uh, make every effort to not to slip and fall. Now the other thing that's, all, it, it, and I've only been at this 30 years, one of the things that amazes me is how many times we go to homes for people that have uh, non-rubber backed throw rugs and, and the slipping, tripping and falling uh, in homes. Those are, those are big customers for us and they're injuries that don't need to occur. So if you, if you have family members or you're on your own, let's make a big effort to, to make the home hazard free. Uh, more than half our call volume involves going to people that have tripped and fallen when uh, those hazards could be eliminated. And I'll speak uh, later about the community paramedicine program that that's part of it is to check homes. Um, one of the other things that uh, would be helpful, we're going to speak about the Blue Bottle program, but to, to go with that for everybody that takes medications, whether you're 20, or, or older, uh, I miss my medications and I can't remember whether I took them or not. Let's see if we can all take advantage of the blister pack program, if everybody's familiar with that. The pharmacy puts them in time, you know, morning, afternoon, evening. Uh, wonderful program and it also lets us know when we get there, we can look at the medications and know whether you've taken them or not. Um, Oh, was there questions to this also? <laughs> Go ahead. Do you have to have a doctor um, asking the pharmacist to do it for you, or can you just, as a, uh, a patient, ask for the list of times? What a wonderful question. <laughs> uh, let's check. That'll be something we'll get back to people. Oh. They're very popular, and they're very useful for us when we come to the home. I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think it is. Oh, okay. Oh. Uh, I went to Manitoba about six years ago, and I just asked Bertha, the IDA, for blister packs, and she gave them to me. I didn't have to go to the cancer or anything. For Outstanding. Thank you, um, One of the other things, <clears throat> that was just my preamble so that we don't have to come to your home. Um, whether you're aware of it or not, when you do, everybody quite familiar how 911 works, you phone and they say police, fire, ambulance for what city? Uh, when you choose ambulance, uh, it goes to our dispatch center and uh, uh, the training that the call takers go through uh, is quite extensive and it's, it's worth the price of admission to see the work that these kids do up there these days. And the most important part is they ask your address and once the address is verified in the computer as being a valid address, it's sent off to a dispatcher who's a completely different person than the call taker. They will remain on the phone with you and ask different questions. Um, and one of the most important parts, in North America, the average time from an incident, this is the average, till the time you're connected with an ambulance call taker is six minutes. I can't overly stress that calling 911, getting on with a trained call taker who, 
in the event of a serious incident such as a cardiac arrest or something, they're all trained in telephone instruction for bystanders to begin immediate CPR. Uh, the window is, is approximately 10 minutes. So while we're able to do some uh, uh, good things before we get to you to extended care at the clinic, if somebody hasn't started before we get there, um, it lessens the chances of us of having a positive outcome. So people often ask me, well, I wonder if I should call 911. You know what? The question's answered. If you're wondering whether you should call or not, give them a call. They'll assess. We take routine calls, we take emerge calls, we take them all. There's no call that you can't uh, uh, phone in. Um, so try to remember that. They can give instruction in all medical incidents, including cardiac arrest, maternity, all those sort of things. So most infants, uh, I've only been at this for a while in Vancouver, uh, I can't believe how many babies were delivered over the phone. All we did was take the mom and the infant to the hospital. So uh, 911 uh, ambulance is, is uh, a wonderful service. Uh, half of all cardiac arrests in North America occur with somebody there at the scene. So try to remember that if you can. So one of the uh, uh, programs that uh, we have in Belmont, almost in all communities, is the Blue Bottle. Uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with it, but it's a uh, program where, um, and this is my first time talking about it, so I'll just go through the uh, different parts. Inside here is a, a medical form. It's in your home. It stays in your freezer, in the freezer door. And a little bit of history about this. Back in the old days, we used to have a paper form that we filled out when we came to your house. And we'd often, as paramedics, leave a copy of it on people's fridges. So the next crew that came to your house would always look to the fridge to see if there was any information about previous calls we'd been to your house. It's all computerized now, so we can't leave the computer at your house. And what they've developed was this program, a decal on your front door, whether you choose to or not. You don't have to put that one on. A magnetic that goes on your freezer. Be advised, all paramedics know to look in a freezer to begin with, but the stickers are handy. And I can't think of a time that would be worse to try to answer the questions we're asking you than when you have your, your incident. It's not the time that you can remember these things. And I can tell you that when we ask you questions, you give us some answers, and when we get to the clinic or a hospital, the nurse asks you questions, you give even more information, and then when the doctor speaks to you, you give even more information because you're starting to remember these things. Let's avoid all that. Uh, there's a place for uh, allergies, uh, the medications you're taking, and just general medical uh, information that I can assure you at two in the morning when we show up at your house and I start asking you all these questions, you'll be like, oh, you just can't possibly be expected to remember this. So uh, we've got a little form, unfortunately, that we were delayed in getting some more of them. They're so popular. But uh, we have a little form. If you give our, your name and address, we'll see that they're dropped off at your home. A uh, couple things to remember. It's this information is it's your information it's kept in your freezer we don't keep a record of it an ambulance um, um, if there's two people at the home then just put two forms in the same bottle uh, it's just that easy um, there's no cost and uh, it would be most helpful for both yourself and the ambulance paramedics what about uh, remembering to update it? Well, that's a great question, and uh, I'm going to talk about the community paramedicine program in Belmont, and, and that's part of the community paramedic, is just to double check that you're routinely um, uh, updating it. But some of the things like allergies, once you have an allergy, it's not going to go away. So it's very important in the middle of the night um, I find it difficult to, myself sometimes to remember uh, different things. So uh, it's, a, it's a very big expectation we have and for who's ever been attended to by a paramedic, question, question, question. 
uh, if the form's already filled out, half the work will be done. And uh, as you're probably aware, we give a variety of medications. Uh, we need to know whether you have an allergy or not before we give the medication. If we can't find that out, we won't be giving the medication. Technically, we're not supposed to make you sicker once we get there. Um, so, uh, if you have any questions, there's a form about the blue uh, bottle program over at our desk, and we, we've got lots of them. Please take one. Um, I have a question. Outstanding. Uh, why would we say put this in the refrigerator? In the freezer. In the freezer? Yeah. In that the freeze, and then <coughs> where? So you guys know where to look for it? Every paramedic in BC knows to look at a fridge. And now the new blue bottle program, where we're first looking is in the door of the freezer. Okay, that's what I need. Uh, down below is probably, if it looks like mine, it would take them an hour to find well, obviously, it. Obviously, the freezer would be down at the bottom and it would never be done. In the door. Um, so, uh, Velmont's a, a wonderful community as far as... Uh, um, the, the health clinic and, and all the doctors and the, the lead doctor, Dr. Markham. Uh, we're the smallest community in British Columbia to have not only a uh, primary care uh, community paramedic, we also have an advanced life care uh, community paramedic. And for those of you not familiar with the program, again, we have more uh, PR information. But what it's uh, started in British Columbia a few years ago uh, that each community has a uh, community paramedic uh, that uh, works in conjunction with the, the uh, uh, clinic and the doctors there. And I'm, I'm not a community paramedic, so I'm just going to read some of the PR on it. So um, they come to the homes regularly for visits between uh, your personal doctor and that. That will be set up. Um, avoiding you having to go to the clinic in some instances, especially during the winter months. Um, connects you with your doctor, um, manages your health and whatnot, checks in about the medications, and naturally the, the uh, Blue Bottle program would be a big part of it. Uh, one of the big things when they initially go to the home, they start to look for those uh, throw rugs without rubber backing tripping hazards, fire hazards, all that sort of thing. They do a home check and see if um, uh, there's any hazards that we can avoid uh, for us to not have to come to your home. And uh, one of the programs, I think, is they try to uh, align you up with community services, um, answer your questions, uh, that sort of thing. So it's a new program, it's just started and I think we can uh, thank Dr. Markham and his group for um, the smallest community in, in British Columbia to have an advanced uh, care paramedic involved in the community paramedic program. Um, Kareem uh, is just in Vancouver receiving additional training for the program and uh, we're looking forward to him coming back soon. Uh, I don't think I'm the greatest PR man on that. That's my first talk about it. Any questions about the community uh, paramedic program? Yes. Could you uh, tell me the cost? Like if you phone 911 and they come to your house, mm -hmm. what does that cost you? Uh, I, I'm not involved in finances. I do know that there's no taxes per month for BC Ambulance Service. Uh, as for fire and police, but I do know there is a cost associated. Uh, I can't give you the exact cost, I'm not involved in that. I believe that if you go to a home and transport it to the clinic, uh, it's is $80 sound about right, Kim? And if you're not transported, uh, I believe it's 50 bucks. Oh, okay, and there are services available if you're not able to cover the cost. And again, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not involved in the financial part of it, but there are services to, to cover the cost, if required. Uh, great question. I should probably look into that uh, and find out uh, uh, what uh, if there's anything to cover those costs. No other questions about community paramedicine? Can you speak to the life loss program? Uh, 
I'm not involved in the lifeline. There's several lifelines available. I, I think there's one through Northern Health, and there's uh, help I've fallen the big advertisements on television out of Boston, uh, the world leader in North America. Uh, there's also, if I'm not mistaken, TELUS is now uh, in the um, um, Help I've Fallen business what's the lifeline. And uh, wonderful program. Uh, we often are sent. Uh, uh, I was sent just a couple weeks ago. And fortunately, it was a, a minor event. But uh, uh, I think it's a great program. Um, it's difficult when you're living on your own and you slip. Uh, and fall and aren't able to get to communication. Uh, I'm not, uh, I don't have any details on it, but I, I know that our particular uh, health clinic would, and I'm sure that our community paramedics are, are up on that, and I'll, I'll make a note to myself on these subjects. Uh, billing. Well, certainly it would be helpful, and if, if you're involved with a community paramedic program, that's something that they're they're interested in updating. But you can always just add to it uh, if you would. Um, the label that's located on the, the prescription would be uh, what we'd like written out, and if you uh, if you need any help with that, the community paramedic would. Do they check ID with you? Absolutely. That's uh, since time began. We generally look for uh, a necklace or a wristband, or I don't know why. Apparently, tattooed uh, things are very popular nowadays. Okay. Do people sign up for the community paramedic program, or is it something that the clinic suggests? It's it's a, it's a involvement of all, all all people, and generally with the clinic and your family doctor and the community paramedic, and it starts with a home visit. It, it's uh, the document's several pages long, and uh, the first thing we're looking to do is to see what the needs are and to make sure the home and the area is safe. Yes. What is the procedure to get a lifeline? Like I have a friend that I think needs. Uh, a lifeline. Um, you know that it's come up several times. I should find out more about that. Yeah. I actually, you're just gonna run to the clinic and get some brochures about lifeline. Mm -hmm. so Whoa. We can answer all those questions. <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> okay. Well, then it's my chance to brag a bit. I, w I wonder if anybody's aware of what happened this summer, first time ever. Uh, we had our first emergency medical error evacuation. So um, I don't know whether everybody's available. This year, um, we've had 13 medical flights out of uh, Vailmont, um, carried on to Vancouver, Edmonton, and uh, one to Prince George. And uh, uh, please uh, ask Holly and Dr. Cater started this some time ago. And the fallback to the community was the pilots didn't want to come in night without there's precision approach lighting that was required to, to make sure the pilots were not too high, not too low. Apparently they have a fear of crashing when they come in. So um, a program, uh, Holly and uh, Dr. Cater got it started and it was successful earlier this year and it installed and uh, it, it, I just can't believe that somebody, a community member, had been uh, hurt quite uh, badly, and uh, the system worked exactly as it designed. And in uh, the early hours, in the darkness, um, an airbag crew came in, got the patient, took them to uh, a higher level of care, and uh, as I understand, the, the member came back to the community. Uh, that's that's what we're here in business for. So. Behind the scenes, there's a lot of things that go on in this community, but uh, this is a record year for us. Uh, 13 uh, medical flights out of the community and uh, two uh, helicopter uh, evacuations off the highway. So um, 
I just thought that it, uh, you should all know the good work that's going on behind the scenes to make sure everybody in town gets the, uh, the best care. And I, I heard somebody else here talk. Uh, I'm from Vancouver. Uh, I've only been here for uh, five years. I don't think I ever got as quick of service in Vancouver that I ever got coming to the clinic here. Um, we're all aware that when advanced care is required, surgeries and stuff like that, we're taken to different communities. But for day-to-day -day medical care, um, the doctors in the clinic uh, here, I can't believe uh, the service that's provided and the care and compassion uh, of the doctors. Uh, in 30 years, it's one of the, the finest uh, communities I've uh, seen uh, for health care. Before I stop droning on, any ambulance uh, questions before I go? Oh, deaf and blind. Just wanted to note that there is another association, the Bailmont Ambulance Association, and we have over the years got CBT funding. The latest equipment that we've got is uh, training dolls, which have worked incredibly well in keeping the paramedics trained. They've also used them in scenarios with the clinic in which they can treat the doll as if they were a real patient. So they can intubate, they can do IVs, they, like, it's not just putting a package beside the patient and say, I'm starting an IV. No, you can start an IV, you can stick something down their throat. Uh, there are responses and it is an incredible teaching tool that has been uh, used by the, the ambulance people. Thanks, Eugene. That, that is something, and for what it's worth, uh, the kids at the station that'll look after, uh, and some older folks, um, every Wednesday night, if you ever go by the ambulance station, you know, there's a lot of cars there. On their own quarter, they all get together on Wednesday nights and train, and, and one of the new advanced dolls we have, um, it has its own pulse. You can listen to the airways, and with what looks like an iPad, you can change all those vitals. So it gives us a chance. Uh, we don't get the hands-on patients every day here. There's not a large enough call volume. Uh, but every Wednesday night, um, uh, we train uh, everything from CPR to drug admin uh, administration. And I guess I'm feeling in a bit of a bragging mood. Uh, we had a, a medical incident uh, that involved CPR uh, a couple of weeks back and uh, all the CPR action and everything is, is recorded by our uh, defibrillators. And uh, very proud of the, the people that attended the call, the four paramedics. Um, we have to get uh, above 90% in three categories, including compressions, how many we do, the depth of them, and the time between things we do. And uh, the very last one, we scored well, well above 90 in all three categories. And I would like to think that the Wednesday night training nights, uh, they all start with two minutes of CPR by everybody at the meeting. So um, it's a good bunch of kids at the station. They're always trying to do a better job. And the CBT has given us uh, that ability with uh, the dolls, uh, the IV arms, uh, they've got monitoring equipment in the ambulances that no ambulances in other communities have. Um, so, thank you to the CBT. So, if no other questions, I'll go have a tea. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So when Sophia comes back, there'll be pamphlets on the Lifeline, but it is a Northern Health run program. And um, if you spoke to Sophia, our social worker, or our interprofessional team lead, Amber, they could um, help you navigate through to get set up and, and then when it gets here to get it set up in the home and things like that. So, Okay, so we're just gonna set up for Krista. She's next to do a little talk about Nordic walking. So again, take a breather, grab some coffee, check out the booths. We'll regroup in a couple of minutes. Thanks.